Good morning, America, and welcome to this morning's Going on Offense webinar. My name is Daryl Moon, and it's my pleasure to be with you today. The very best healthcare system in the world is the aspirational healthcare model. The South Central Foundation's NUCA system of care in Alaska is the best example of this model. They are the only healthcare system that has won the President's Malcolm Baldrige Award twice, once in 2011 and again in 2017. Countries from all over the world travel to Alaska to learn how the NUCA system of care can be so much better than all other systems, half the cost with far better outcomes. Well, I'm honored today to have as my guest panelist a leading pioneer in the area of transforming healthcare to a better model, Dr. Firuz Danish Gari, who's the founder and president of Bowtie Medical, is with me, and I've asked Dr. Danish Gari to join me today to discuss this aspirational healthcare model and how can we go about transforming to this better model of healthcare. Welcome, to Dr. Danish Gari, and thank you for being with me today. Uh, thank you, Daryl. It's an honor and pleasure to be here uh, participating in this uh, uh, wonderful uh, platform you have. Thank you, and can you take a few minutes, just take a couple minutes to introduce yourself? Um, uh, sure. I am a surgeon scientist. I was uh, uh, trained at the University of Chicago, Loyola, University of Colorado, UT Southwestern, and very fast uh, raised to the uh, academic uh, leadership in the field, in the field of uh, urology and female pelvic surgery. I founded a uh, or one of the founders of the fe uh, field of female pelvic surgery. That put me into a uh, leadership position at uh, Cleveland Clinic at University Hospitals of Case Western Reserve University, where I was the chair or director. And because of that, I was, uh, uh, as I was asked to serve on the board of uh, one of these uh, clinical enterprises, about 11 hospitals, $3 billion a year revenue, which uh, uh, basically proposed a question to me that I had never seen in my uh, career after training over you know 100 uh, residents and fellows publishing over 200 scientific uh, papers and operating on thousands of people and the question was why we have the most expensive healthcare in the world why we spend uh, so much energy training probably some of the best, if not the best, providers in the world, the doctors, surgeons, and so forth, but we are spending the, uh, the highest amount of our uh, money on the healthcare, and we are not getting the uh, best outcomes. Uh, so uh, that question found an answer when I was sitting on the board, which I'll be able to share, but that has started the journey for me to going back to looking at uh, the existing uh, causes of the dysfunctionality of our healthcare system. Uh, so there's no question that our system is the most expensive. We are spending three to five hundred percent more than the rest of the world. WHO uh, ranks our outcomes based on their criteria on the 30th and 40th, close to third world countries. And the answer was very uh, uh, took me two years to go to a business school uh, to go back to the origin of employer-sponsored healthcare, going back to the origin of why the hospitals have turned from the charity houses of the late 18th and 19th century to basically big uh, oligoplastic uh, financial institutions of today, and how we could uh, build basically the next efficient model. I went around the world because of the privilege I had and looked at all the other models that may represent uh, a, a copying model, but I didn't find that. And probably the Minister of Health in Brazil broke the news to me and said, Firuz, uh, you need to go back and roll up your sleeve uh, with your colleagues and innovate the next model. The next model that you guys can adopt doesn't exist in the world, regardless of the, the title, whether it's a single payer, single provider, single payer, multiple provider, and so forth. You guys have the most advanced technology, the brain power, the money, and you guys are the one who have to generate the next efficient model of the healthcare. So that uh, uh, journey uh, brought me to uh, stepping down from my position and founding uh, the Bowtie Medical, the company that I run now, and that has exposed me to other brilliant people such as yourself. So it's been a true pleasure. 
Thank you. Uh, you know, you've learned as you've been in the middle of this transformation that it's not easy. It's a very difficult thing to move a deficit-based healthcare system into an aspirational model, which is about prevention and helping people take ownership of their own health. Um, tell us a little bit about the process you've gone through as you've been gone from urology into developing this more effective primary care system. Talk a little bit about what that transition has looked like for you and how difficult it is to kind of build a new model. Um, of course, as you say, if it was easy, it would have been done by now. Uh, the, uh, again, I learned that lesson in the scientific world I have. I still have a research lab that uh, draws uh, funds from the National Institute of Health. So I'm familiar from the, on the process of going from unknown to known. Uh, what does it take? Uh, the first, you go and do your due diligence. You go to the library. We used to go. Now we go online. And because uh, the uh, wording was that if you have thought of an idea, someone else has thought about that too, and there's some publication record of it. So you go and find out what is there. And uh, But the fact that uh, the complete uh, solution or the steps toward the complete solution has not been basically born, uh, that tells you that opportunity exists. So the fact that the, uh, the uh, solution uh, may not be present here in front of our face doesn't disvalidate, the, as they, they call the fundamentals of the market, right? The dysfunctionality of the system are the facts. We have the most expensive healthcare system in the world, right? We are not gaining the best outcome, whether you want to uh, go after WHO or just go after your own community. The fact that three out of five Americans have chronic conditions and more than one to three chronic conditions, the fact that we are not becoming a healthier population uh, as years go by to the reverse. Now the majority of the time of our retirement uh, ages are spending going from doctor's appointment to another doctor. So those very common sense, uh, I think, concepts tells you there's something wrong. Because, again, I, uh, we don't have time to go through the process, the journey that I went through. Uh, one of my professors at the business school said, what is wrong with it for us to spend a lot of money on our health care? It's like you, go, you buy the best car you, in the market. I said, that is the word mispricing comes in. In the efficient market, you go and buy a Lexus, but you get the quality out of it. In this process, we are spending three to 500% but we are not getting the call. That's called the mispriced, right? <laughs> so um, the fundamentals are that we are the most expensive. We are not producing the qualities. Eat, and uh, if you don't believe me, then the govern, government and the uh, private sector, the government is paying for about 60, 70 million of our, of our health care expenses. The employers are spend, uh, paying for another 200 million of us. Both of them are sick and tired of the cost of the health care and the bad outcomes, right? That's why the Medicare's uh, number one job is to go uh, payment, uh, uh, basically revision after revision after revision. I mean, it's the catch-up game between the hospital system and the Medicare. Who can beat who? And uh, employers are definitely sick and tired of being uh, basically spending the average uh, employer sponsored uh, healthcare in Northeast Ohio where I live for a family of four is $28,000. The average housing price is $17,000. The average transportation price is $9,000 and the food is less than $5,000. So the healthcare not being the number one need of human being has become the number one drain of, the, of our resources. So those are the fundamentals of, of, of the market. So the question becomes why? Why this happened? Are we stupid? Excuse my French. Are we retarded compared to the rest of the world? What is it that is there? And that is where the pathophysiology comes in. Uh, that why this has happened and it has a very, in my opinion, again as a funded scientist, it has a very scientific uh, pathophysiology. And that's why I think the solutions that don't go after those pathophysiologies, they go after the lip service. It's like and so forth, they're not going to work, you know, is the, uh, and we can discuss this further, but I think I'm actually, actually have uh, uh, turned this into a, 
a very three components. These are the three facts. These are the three symptoms of our sickness, right? And these are the three pathophysiological causes. It's like the first time you get the chest pain, you go to the doctor and say, oops, your coronary arteries are plugged. Say, why? They have a pathophysiology, right? It's your uh, diet and the rest of it and so on. So it's a very, to me, it's a very scientific base. The question is, uh, you were asking, uh, Daryl, is uh, why it's been difficult? Why it's been difficult to change that? I think the, um, the reason is this is the largest industry in the country, in the world. You know, worldwide. Seven trillion dollars is spent on the healthcare. In the U.S., we spend half of it, 3.5 trillion dollars. Let me, if I can shock you with the next number, about half of that 3.5 trillion is a waste. Yep. So if you take out the waste out of the U.S. healthcare system, is more than the economy of South Korea, more than the GDP of Russia. So we don't have to deal with the Putin guy. We can just go and buy him if we save our healthcare uh, waste. <laughs> <laughs> I love those statistics. You know, you're one of the few people that I've come across in the country who is passionate, as I am, about helping people not get chronic conditions. If we really want to solve the problem, we can't wait till someone has the heart attack. We have to address it ahead of time. And you can't just simply say, well, let's take the few people who are already spending a lot of money and let's see if we can intervene. We have to get upstream. Talk a little bit about that diagram you showed me the other day that just talks about there's a whole group that we're not addressing, and that is the underlying fundamental correction. Right. So going back to the pathophysiology, if I may, is uh, there are really uh, three causes. One is, uh, uh, after the World War II, uh, the intermediaries have come between the user, consumer of the healthcare, and the provider, the doctor. And we can show this in the graph. So if 100 years ago, if I was a doctor, you were the patient, you come to me, you, you we interact directly, right? Intermediaries in the middle have come is the, uh, the insurance came in first, and then the employers who bought the insurance for you, and then the brokers who interacted between the employer and the insurance, and then the hospitals, they came in to make the deal on the prices with, uh, with the insurance company. Those intermediation has separated these two pillars of the healthcare, where basically a moral hazard has happened. The patient, the consumer, uh, thinks that someone else is paying for their expenses, and the doctors, uh, basically their alignment has been aligned with their employers who are the hospitals. That's number one pathophysiology, uh, that these two Basically, stakeholders, the pillars have been separated by these intermediaries, have created this confusion in the mind of the consumer that they're not a customer anymore. That's number one. Number two is this care that this doctor is providing is primarily delivered through a what I call a hospital-based sick care system. Yeah. Our system, our current 3.5 trillion, is nothing but a sick care system. They uh, I have a podcast that some of your listeners could listen, uh, and a very smart medical student told me that. They said they train us in the medical school that our job starts with the chief complaint, and that is true. In the traditional uh, training, if you don't have a chief medical complaint, you don't go see a doctor. But when we know that the chief complaint is just the tip of the iceberg, is the beginning of the symptoms. The process of the disease has started way before the chief complaint. Right. So that is number two. The care is delivered by, by this hospital sick care system that they have really turned into large financial institutions that they compete for the margins. Right? The hospital CEOs could go and run a chair manufacturing company or run the hospital. They're the same. <laughs> Number three is the combination of the above, combination of this engagement of the consumer and the provider that doesn't have any uh, accountability in terms of the cost toward that consumer has allowed them to generate about 50% of the services that are considered waste. Waste meaning that none of the services contribute to the health outcome of that consumer. Right? When you put this together, this creates the waste, and then 
continues to uh, snowball and has created this misalignment between the, uh, frankly, and we can discuss this going back to the primary care physician, but I just want to focus on these uh, three items. One is the disengagement of the consumer. Two is care is provided with no limitations whatsoever. I used to give the lectures uh, 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 to, you know, 20,000 urologists around the world. I said, we are the only industry that we get paid for the surgeries we do and for the complications we cause by, uh, by our surgeries. That's true, right? Can you imagine you go and buy a car, you drive out of the lot, and then the tire falls off or the engine doesn't work. You bring it back, tow it back to the dealership, and the dealer says, hmm, now you have to pay me for another car. <laughs> That's how we do in the hospital. <laughs> but, and the combination of these two has created the, the, the waste, 50% waste, which is, again, is not my research, it's a published research. 50% is, uh, is one of the older actual research. 50% uh, of the current services delivered by this 5,000 hospital-based sick care system is waste. So you've addressed the problem by building a far more preventative virtual primary care system. So bow tie is in that kind of leading edge of transforming healthcare into getting upstream. It's not just about once you fall off the cliff, now let's fix you. It's about how do we help you as a customer owner really engage in the best health. Talk a little bit about your team approach and this idea of virtual primary care. Sure. If I may, I, uh, is, if you, uh, maybe we, uh, cut the, I can maybe share you a slide here. I think maybe visually. Presenter. Here we go. So if you um, uh, see this, uh, basically uh, what I call the from basket to casket concept. Uh, look at the uh, natural history of our health from birth to death. Um, so uh, we are born uh, and we go basically through the conditions of life uh, until we, at uh, one age, we, we die. Going back to 100 years ago, this process was determined and it still is determined by what we call the causes of death, right? Causes of death about 100 years ago were infectious diseases. Before antibiotics were discovered, the vaccines were discovered and so forth. So. What we, uh, the number one was. Number two were uh, cardiovascular cancer trauma. So what we smartly discovered is the best method to drop the infectious diseases were to create public health. Uh, the public health services will address the infectious diseases. And then at the same time, we created this hospital system that will take care of the cardiovascular cancer uh, traumas and so forth. The, in the meantime, because of the sick care system that is basically takes care of the sickness, we have increasingly seen chronic conditions, a rise of chronic conditions, diabetes, obesity, musculoskeletal, mental health, and so forth. And now the question, I think, uh, what you're asking is, who is in charge of this? Because we know until the chief complaint issue hasn't started, the hospital doesn't have a service to help us. If I'm 24 and I just graduated from college and I just lost a cousin or an uncle to COVID and I know because he had, he was obese or he had diabetes and so forth, I, there's no place for me to go and say, uh, Mr. Whoever, uh, that could you help me that by the time I get to my age of 50 or 45 or 60, I won't be obese or diabetic. I have done this exercise with medical students and the nurses. I say, if you're that person who just starting your career, where would you go? You go to, they don't know where to go. They say, one of them said, I'll go to primary care. I said, okay, well, let's take that. You go to primary care and say, could you help me not to get obese or have diabetes at the age of 50? They'll look at you if you're a zombie. They say, <laughs> go, on, go on Google. I don't know. The only job I have is to give you a prescription or refer you to a specialist. Right. So, what I'm try trying to point out of this, the time and COVID showed us very clearly that time has arrived for us to create a, basically what 
beyond the health, uh, public health that gives us the infectious disease control, vaccination, clean food, clean water, and so forth. And the sick care system that will take care of us, cancer and trauma and cardiovascular when we have the heart attack, there is a need for the system in the middle that technically I call it bowtie health guardians. This is the segment of the system that needs to help us not to get sick and not to develop that chief complaint that would uh, take us to the hospital sick care system. So this is, as you remember, during the COVID, if I make the example, when the COVID hit us as a, a largest health crisis, public health it started issuing decrees and orders, stay home, social distancing, wear masks, and so forth. The hospitals started taking care of people who were sick by COVID, you know, needed ventilator and so forth. And as you could see, because public health is poorly funded, they couldn't provide testing. The hospital system, I have an email from a CEO of one of the largest hospitals, said, we can't do testing for you unless you are going to be admitted to the hospital. 90% of the population was in the middle. They wanted to, they were following the public health directives and they were praying that they won't get sick, go to the hospital. No one was there to help them how to remain healthy and how to basically avoid this health crisis. If you expand this example of COVID to diabetes, to obesity, to all the stuff that uh, basically gets us at the end of the life and so forth, who's going there to help us to remain healthy, that system doesn't need a, doesn't have an institution, doesn't have an owner as of today. And that's what your virtual primary care system is designed to do. Exactly. So, so talk a little bit about what does that look like for the person that's never heard of virtual primary care Tell us what that looks like, and then if you will, share with me your perspective on how healthcare is ready to do a similar transition that what the IT industry did back in 1970 and 1980. I love that story. Yes, yeah, sure, sure. The, um, um, so this is an example I think I'd like to share with you. This is a published study from in Lancet that looks at basically the natural history of Alzheimer's disease from the time again we are born to the age of 75, let's say I have whatever risk factors for the Alzheimer. So this is where I started having cognitive issues, some neurological changes, and so forth. And that is where the symptoms start. This is where the current sick care involvement with me starts. You know, let's say I'm 75, I start forgetting things, I forget the name of my loved ones, I don't know where to go, and so forth. They take me to a neurologist, they do a bunch of tests, they say, okay, you have dementia, and now you have the diagnosis of Alzheimer's, right? Now we have enough science for all of these risk factors from diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular, mental health, and so forth. Really, when what the current sick care system calls it that preventive, meaning a screening for the test, this is the, the horse is out of the barn. This is too late. We have enough science now for every chronic condition that there are basically risk uh, uh, activities or the thing that we can do to reduce our risks so we would never develop those, or the activities that if we don't do and we have, the risk factors we have, that will lead us to basically to those, uh, to those conditions. Again, for Alzheimer's, this is a published study from Lancet, one of the widely distributed journals. If you are physically active, if you have a good diet and nutrition, if we have a good education and so forth, that will reduce our risk toward Alzheimer's development. If we are obese, we smoke, we alcohol misuse, we have depression, that would lead us to Alzheimer's. So again, uh, this example, again, this table is the published paper in the peer-reviewed paper. Regardless of uh, basically where I'm born, if I have these risk factors, I'm going to be protected. If I have these risk factors, uh, or if I basically have these activities, I'm going to be protected. If I have this risk factor, I'm exposed to have Alzheimer's disease. If you take this to the next level, so basically the job of the system is now, again, the sick care takes care of the diagnosed diseases when the symptoms are developed, uh, that's what the screening is. You know, when women go for mammography and you have a lesion, 
they're already the breast cancer is there or if you are a male you go and get the prostatic specific antigen your PSA is up you already have a nucleus of the cancer that is not really preventive measure it's in a screening to find a new disease so the sick care system can take care of a new disease and make money the risk factor is really the prevention is really here to identify the risk factors again they're published data for all the diseases and how to mitigate uh, basically course changing the course so I would not get that lump in uh, you know in the breast of the female the prostate cancer the cardiovascular diabetes and so so if you um, um, basically consider this based on the previous slide I presented that this basically risk medication now needs needs a new owner new institutional owner and I believe the, uh, the concept of what you said, the virtual primary care, it is uh, what Bowtie has, uh, basic, uh, has innovated, that if you take a clinician who understands the process of formation of the disease, understands and so forth, and equip that physician with uh, other professionals, a nutritionist, a, a exercise person, a person who handles the mental health issue and so forth, Try to look for all these risk factors in my in my life, and then work with me, engage me through the platforms that uh, Daryl you have developed. Uh, engage me to basically change the course of my disease, change the course of the fate of my conditions. So this is what really uh, the construction of the uh, virtual primary care, or we call it the bow tie care, is combining the integrating the elements that would help us to reduce the risk uh, for all the chronic condition and based on the innovations we have done we believe 95% uh, plus of this could be delivered virtual and that's why the term virtual primary care comes in. The virtual primary care that the bowtie delivers is really that health guardianship concept and the bowtie concept is not just because I like to wear bow ties. Bow tie is actually a health medication policy or strategy that is taught in the business school. The nut of the bow tie is the hazard, is the risk, the Alzheimer issue. The left wing of the bow tie is the thing you could do to prevent it. The right side of the bow tie are the thing that you have to do after the hazard has happened. When the person has developed the dementia or the Alzheimer, now you're dealing with the consequences. So that's why we call this a, a bow tie care or a, uh, I'll show you another one, uh, the, uh, um, the uh, health guardianship that helps us to basically prevent our health, prevent our diseases or our risk for developing chronic conditions. The issue of the uh, pri uh, personal computer story is I think uh, COVID has shown us uh, that this area needs uh, new uh, owner, uh, new institutions. And I think there is going to be a gold rush for disruption of the healthcare uh, because this idea has been born and there will be a ton of innovative companies who could come together and basically create this new establishment. So again, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Dennis Kari. We appreciate your support. But again, have a wonderful day and this has been fantastic. Thank you, Daryl.